Well, thank you everyone for attending this session. Yeah, we're ready to go. <clears throat> so today, well, my name is Carlos Sierra, and today we're going to be talking about SQL Tuning 101, uh, mostly for developers. So developers here, non-developers. OK, we have one non-developer, two, a couple of non-developers. OK, so the, the, the main focus is going to be for developers. But again, I mean, if you have any questions, just, just let me know. It really doesn't matter. I, I do the same presentation for DBAs. It's just the kind of questions, so the, the focus changes a little bit. I mean, what is your, your background? So for the agenda for today, we are going to talk a little bit about motivation. Then some methodology, how do we do SQL tuning? And I cover some relevant topics like execution plan, code based optimizer, plan stability. You guys have been hearing about all this during this week. So if you have attended one of my sessions or Mauro sessions or Kerry Oldman session or Maria Colgan session, there is some kind of some overlap. I'm going to try to fill some gaps. And if you haven't attended those sessions, then um, uh, I will try not to lose you. So that will be my, my challenge. And at the end, I'm going to mention about some free tools that we can use for SQL tuning. <coughs> Motivation, first one here. One SQL statement can actually take pretty much down the entire system. We see this often. I mean, from the database perspective, I, I cover both. I mean, I, I, am, I consider myself a DBA, but, but first, I am a developer. So I, I, I cover both bases. And I have seen cases where one SQL statement may, may pretty much consume a big chunk of the resources of an entire system. For example, here, on this pie chart, I can see this is a SQL ID. I can see this particular SQL ID basically being responsible for 25% of the total database time for this system. And usually on a system, we have like thousands of, of SQL statements. So when I see one SQL statement taking a big chunk, that is a red flag. As a DBA, that would be a red flag. And also as a developer. As a developer, we don't want to, to be the one that is basically bringing down an entire system. So SQL tuning. Yes, it is complex. SQL tuning is not trivial. I mean, sometimes I mean, you have a SQL tuning issue, and you say, can you, can you have something fixed in, within an hour? My answer is no, I, I cannot commit. I mean, first I need to see what is that is going on. It may take me less than an hour, or it may take me a full day. It may take more than a day to fix a SQL tuning issue. In the meantime, I mean, we may be able to find some band-aid um, mitigation, like maybe a profile, maybe a baseline. Those are not fixes. Those are fixes. When, when my, one of my DBAs says, oh, I'm going to fix this one with a baseline, I, I just stop him or her right there saying, no, that is not a fix. That is a workaround. Let's implement a workaround first. Fine, because it's production. Let's, let's uh, kind of solve the issue in production, but that is not actually resolved. We have to work on a root cause analysis, find what is that, that put us here on this, on this issue right now, and then, I mean, we, we work on a permanent fix. So part science, part art. SQL tuning is one of those areas which is not like a precise mathematical thing. It, it has a little bit of art. It has a little bit of science. It requires a lot of uh, diagnostics, like, like following the, the scientific method. We, we create some hypotheses. We try them. We, we uh, rule them out, or we try again. At the same time, it, you have to be creative. I, I think that is the main reason why SQL tuning is hard, is because we need to basically have a little bit of these two. We have to be creative at the same time. Five minutes left. <laughs> Thank you, Mauro. <laughs> at, the, at the same time, we have to be creative. So it has the two of them. Anyway, so 
who do you think is responsible for, for SQL tuning? Who thinks the DBA is responsible for SQL tuning? Who thinks this, it is the developer? Okay, good, perfect. And sometimes we say, no, 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 this is an Oracle database, so it's an Oracle application, let's, let's follow with Oracle. Sometimes that happens. <coughs> sometimes we say the application vendor. Reality is, in general, what I have seen out there, everyone tries to avoid SQL tuning. I always say that SQL tuning is like sushi. I love sushi, but sushi is either you love it or you hate it. Usually there is no in between. The same is true with SQL tuning. Either you are a fanatic of SQL tuning, you want to do it, or you say, well, I'm here because I have to. I have to learn some SQL tuning. I, I see some, <laughs> some smiles, so, so it's more, more about the second one, right? We, don't, we, don't, we have to deal with it, and that, that happens a lot. If, if I were to explain methodology, you find different opinions out there. You find people that say, oh, these are the 20 steps for SQL tuning, or whatever, right? Or the 10 rules for SQL tuning. In my mind, we have three pillars of SQL tuning, as we can see there, right? Actually, there are four, right? <laughs> good, 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 <laughs> good. So that, that means you are awake, thank you. <laughs> what happens is the following. These are the three that we always think on. Diagnostic collection, so that means I get something out of the database. It could be the execution plan, it could be an AWR report, something. We get some kind of diagnostics. A trace ticket prof, we start somewhere. Then we work on the root cause analysis. That's when we invest time. And then we work on remediation. And the, the, the one that we usually forget is this one here, good practices. If we were to start with good practices, we, we can avoid many of these. I work as a consultant, and I consider myself still a consultant, and this is the one that we love. Why? Because if I go to a client and I know that they're not following some good practices, I know I will have work forever, okay? <laughs> so, so we love this one here. If we don't see good practices, that is good news for the consultant, but not good news for a client, because you have to invest a lot of money, fixing issues again and again. When I see good practices, which is usually the, the forgotten piece of SQL tuning, is, it's like a trade-off. You give something, you, you receive something. After working with the cost-based optimizer for many, many years, I came to the conclusion that it's, it is a hair. It's not a him, it's a hair. And actually, cost-based optimizer reminds me my mother-in-law. <laughs> when you are really nice, when I am really nice to my mother-in-law, she may be nice to me. But if I am not nice, I cannot expect her to be nice to me. Okay, that's a very simple rule. With the cost-based optimizer, it's the same. If you do everything right, what the cost-based optimizer is expecting, most probably your execution plans are gonna be stable, are gonna be fine, they're gonna work fine, perfectly fine. But if you start doing something like, for example, not gathering statistics, or gathering them in the wrong, in the wrong time, or not providing the right indexes, or um, changing parameters, then don't expect good results. You, you should be expecting some, some payback, okay? Just keep that in mind. You have to be nice to the optimizer. When you have your environment that is healthy, there is less SQL tuning to see. I mean, and again, as a consultant, you go on site, check parameters, check the configuration, how often do you gather statistics. Depending how you get those answers, you know what is coming. You know that you will have a lot of work or you, have, you will have little work to do. So that is, that is very simple. So in general, I would say it's a win-win, good practices. Everyone wins except consultants like myself. So just, just keep, that, keep that in mind. Some of the good practices I'm referring to. Well, first, you want to start with a modern and solid database release. For example, if you were to tell me you are on 11.201 or 11.107 or 11 whatever, that is not 11.204, that raises a flag. If you are on 12C, you are fine, you are fine. But I would like to see if you are on 12C, I would like you to be in what? 12.2 or? Or 2, 12.2 or 2, 
right? If you are still on 12201, you are kind of okay, but you wanna be on the latest and greatest patch set. Why? Because as you know, I mean, a, a software is not perfect. So you are in a very old version of the optimizer, or you are on a release and you haven't applied any, any major patch set for that release, well, you know that there will be many known issues that you are exposed to. It doesn't mean they're affecting you, but you're exposed to. So you start with a solid release. Another one, try, try not to set any CBO parameter unless your application vendor requires them. Some application vendors like eBusiness, Paro Foraco, require some setup of optimizer. Cibo, another one that requires some setup. But if, if it is a custom application, try not to use any parameter. If you are finding yourself that you have to set up some parameter for the optimizer to work, uh, there is something that is kind of a, requires better investigation on your application. The best application is that, the one that requires no parameters. If you are finding your application requires to set up some CBO parameters, that brings a huge question mark about your application. It's as simple as that. Another one, gather statistics in such a way that they follow your data. Oracle has been working for many, many years to make the statistics as useful as possible on a plain and simple way. If you are on 11.2.04 or higher, just using the aromatic job that Oracle provides is pretty much what you need. There will be some corner cases. If you are doing ETL and you have a massive load of data, yes, at the end of, the, at the end of your load and before you start consuming data, you may want to gather statistics for those subjects. In other words, if you change your data a lot, you may need in addition to this, you may need to gather stats at the right time. Some cases we see gathering of statistics asynchronous. Asynchronous when we load the data. So that means we have a job that we schedule every four hours to gather stats and we run it here like every seven hours, just to give an example. So that means some, at some moments, the statistics are gonna be refreshed on, at the right time but at some other times, statistics are outdated for hours. So just try to synchronize those two so you don't have that situation. I mean, the best way to gather stats when you have an ETL is during the ETL process at the very end, once you load data, gather stats before you consume data. That is a question that we see often. The last one is, as developers, we want to write reasonable SQL. I have any situations where our developers they, they are really good Java developers, but they have never written a SQL statement. So when they interact with the database, the quality of the SQL that they produce is not the best. So for those developers, I would say, learn more SQL. You don't have to know everything, but if you are going to be writing SQL, you need to understand better the database, and you need to, to learn how to write better SQL. Very easy, better SQL is something that is clean, and if someone else is reading the SQL, we can make sense of what, it, what it you're trying to do, and try to avoid fancy stuff. The more fancy stuff you, I see in your SQL, the more the cost-based optimizer is going to struggle trying to generate a reasonable execution plan. So that is, that is basically good practices, that's it. That's, that's what I recommend in terms of good practices. In terms of parameters, parameters that we see often that we shouldn't see at all are these. We see, for example, oh, we did an upgrade to 12C, but we decided to leave optimizer features enabled to a prior release. Well, guess what? You're using the optimizer of the prior release, and not quite, not quite, because even if you were on that prior release, and this version of optimizer that you're trying to set is not exactly the same. So avoid the temptation to use this one Another one that is common, optimizer index cost adjustment. We were trying to avoid seeing full scans. Then we say, oh, but if I use this one to one, then I see more index access. You're trying to outsmart the CBO. I have already tried to smart my mother-in-law, and it fails, <laughs> okay? <laughs> optimizer index caching, the same. You see this a lot, it shouldn't be there. DB5 multiple read count. 
in the past, it was, it was a common practice to change this parameter to some values that we understood were better. Today, the recommendation is do not set this parameter. Just let it be. This parameter is actually controlling two things in the background which work better if we don't try to set them up. Just leave the default. Cursor sharing. This one is not an optimized parameter. Cursor sharing has three possible values. It has exact, force, similar. The default is exact, and that is what we want to use. The other two, who uses force here? Some of you guys, I see one hand, good. Who uses similar? No hands, that's even better. Similar is deprecated, and we should not use similar. When, when this parameter came to life, I mean, it was, I mean, it came with two values, exact and force. Force means our application is designed and built to use literals and not binds. By using literals and not binds, it doesn't scale. So I could say, well, you have to change your application, but in the meantime, I'm gonna give you a workaround, which is this parameter cost on sharing force, which basically is going to change your SQL from using literals to using binds. It's not perfect, it's not a solution, it is a band-aid. And basically what we're expecting is application developers to go back and fix the application to use binds when, when we have to use binds. There were some issues, some concerns, et cetera, and then Oracle came with this other value that's called similar. And the attempt with similar it was something in between force and exact. The only thing that we never anticipated, that generates the worst performance. So instead of improving, improving either one of these two, it was worse. It was, it was bogus and the performance was, was kind of um, questionable. So similar was abandoned, but still we see every once in a while parameters set, course of sharing similar. If you have course of sharing similar, that's something you don't want to see. Optimizing dynamic sampling. It's another one that you don't want to change the default. The default is two. That two, I mean, we, we can talk hours about optimizing dynamic sampling. The only thing I want to say here is leave it alone, use the default. Optimizer mode. The optimizer mode, that the, the default is all rows. You can change that, yes you could. You want to change that, the answer is no. So that is just a subset of the parameter that we see every once in a while, just going back here. If you see on your um, initadora SP file, you see a bunch of CBO parameters, question every single one of those parameters. It's quite common that we set up a parameter 10 years ago, and then we have been carrying that parameter on every single release, and right now, nobody knows why we set the parameter to that value. In my opinion, if no, no one knows why that parameter is set, that's a parameter you need to remove. Of course, it requires testing, because every time we change a global parameter, something is going to improve and something is gonna break. Just keep, in the, keep the following in mind. I, I worked for support for many years, in Oracle support. And in my mind, I was saying, this product has so many issues. So every, everyone is complaining about the, the problem, right? Or the, the, the performance, whatever. New upgrade, something breaks. The reality is the following. Every time you, you upgrade or you change a parameter, even if you have 99 sequels that perform better and one that degrades, no one is going to come and say, oh, your SQL is working better today. Congrats. <laughs> no one. But someone is going to complain for the one SQL that is, is degrading. So it gives you the impression that you make a change and something breaks. Yes, you make a change and 90 things, 99 things got better, one broke. Overall, your system is better. So at some point you have to bite the bullet and say, you know what, I'm doing a major upgrade. I'm going to use this as, as an opportunity to do a cleanup of all my parameters. And I'm going to leave only the ones I really need. Is, is that clear? Any questions so far? No? Okay. So regarding diagnostics collection, what do you use today? I mean, you have an issue, you have something broke, you, you want to diagnose a SQL statement, you know the SQL ID, how do you move forward? What do you do next? Come on. Enterprise manager. Who's the enterprise manager? Enterprise manager. Who has access to enterprise manager? Few hands, few hands. 
most developers, we do not have access to Enterprise Manager. If we have access to the Enterprise Manager, we go to the Enterprise Manager, go, look, we're looking for top SQL, we find the top SQL, we find the SQL that is causing 25% of the issues. What do you do next? Once you know the SQL, what is your next step? You look at the execution plan, you say it looks pretty. It's, it, the execution plan looks pretty. What do you do next? It, well, it's not good. It looks pretty. When you see the execution plan, how do you move forward? Let's say it's performing poorly. So you look at the execution plan, you say, well, everything looks good. <laughs> look at it again. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> Sometimes what I see part of that loop is, oh, let me gather the stats. And just hoping that somehow it's going to look better. And sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, what do you do next? Try to force a different that is correct. We're, we're looking for a workaround. We're not solving the issue. The issue is going to be there. We're just trying to find like the back door, saying, is there any other execution plan for this SQL that has performed better in the past? If the answer is yes, perfect. I just pin that plan and I move to the next file. Right? That's what we do. That's what we do. Unfortunately, that is not solving the issue. We're just <coughs> skipping the issue for, for, for now. Tomorrow, the application developer, who is maybe us, we added a column to the SQL, the SQL changes, and suddenly the performance is back to suck. Right? So we have to do the same technique. So we're not solving the issue. Mm -hmm. So at some point, we, said, we had to say, OK, now I have the time. I'm going to solve this issue. In order to do that, I need to collect some diagnostics. I have the execution plan. What else do I need? I need to know more about the statistics. I need to know more about the indexes that I have. I need to know more about the parameters that may be affecting the SQL. I need to look if, if there is some history that the SQL was performing fine before, I need to see what was different. If my SQL is using binds, I need to see which binds were used at the time it was parsed today and when it was performing fine. And as you start digging, you will find that there, is a, there, there are a lot of dependencies. It's not just one or two. There are many dependencies. Unfortunately, on Enterprise Manager, we don't have that level of detail. So that means we go to SQL, SQL Plus, or SQL Developer, and start making queries. We look for this data. We look for these other views, et cetera. And sure enough, sooner or later, we get a whole picture of what is that is going on. That whole picture may take one hour, may take you a couple of weeks to find why your SQL broke. Once you get to that point, then you can solve it. So for diagnostic collection, the first step is to find the SQL ID, which means is basically just search for the SQL. For, in order to do that, we use Enterprise Manager, we use AWA, or as application developers, we use the DBA. The DBA is the one that gets the phone. He, they call us somehow, they knew it was us. We cannot hide, it was us, right? They say this equal is yours. So, so that's the first step. And then we use a Oracle tools. We have a bunch of Oracle tools, like Enterprise Manager, a, a Trace, TK Prof, a DBMS Explain. We have some tools. And after that, if those tools are not enough, because if those tools are enough, fine, solve the issue right there. But if those tools are not enough, you need to go and start using some more specialized tools. Yeah, so you go from the Oracle provide. Oracle gives you the basics to start working. If you can solve with, those, with this info, you can solve 80% of the issues, you are good. For the remaining 20%, you need, you need to go deeper. So how do we find the SQL? Yeah, we can use Enterprise Manager with all the names. Enterprise Manager can be called Database, Grid, Cloud, Control. It has different names, but it's the same is the same thing. It's Enterprise Manager. We can use AWR or Stats Pack. We can use Trace Ticket Prof. Maybe we just query directly V$ session, V$ SQL. We find our SQL. Regarding which tools we can use from, from Oracle, we have Trace Ticket Prof, Ash. Ash is active session history. Anyone here is using Ash to diagnose a SQL performing poorly? I see one hand, two, few hands. Ash, I would say, is a new trace. In the past, 
we use this guy. Today, we use this guy. Ash basically is building a history of what is going on on, on our entire system. So the main advantage of this one over this one is Ash is always there. I don't have to go back and say, oh, my report that took five hours is slow. Oh, let me turn trace on and rerun my report. I don't have to do that if I have Ash. We can use explain plan four. Not recommended, but we can use it. We can use auto trace, SQL developer, DBMS explain. Maria was talking about DBMS explain. We can use SQL monitor. And Maria was asking, who is using SQL Monitor? And I only, only saw a couple of hands. Let me ask the question again. Who is using SQL Monitor here? Few hands. If you notice, well, you don't notice, but I notice, there is an overlap between who uses Enterprise Manager and who uses SQL Monitor. Or the same people. If you are using Enterprise Manager, then you have access to SQL Monitor. But if you don't have access to Enterprise Manager, you still have access to SQL Monitor. OK, that is the trick here. If you have no access to Enterprise Manager, you can still use SQL Monitor from SQL Plus. Did you know that, that you can use SQL Monitor from SQL Plus? OK, I'm going to show you how we can use SQL Monitor from SQL Plus in a moment. SQL Trace, we talk, about, uh, we talk a lot about SQL Trace in one other session. That is the old, the old way to do it. Where do I find the trace? How does it look, the ticket prof? Blah, blah, ticket prof, we cover all that. Ash, active session history. Basically, what we do with Ash, every second, we look at what we have on B dollar session. A B dollar session is a view that contains some, some important pieces of data, such as what is the SQL that is currently in execution by this, by this session, what is if, if I have a, an, an execution plan for that SQL that is in fly, in which line of the execution I am, and what, what is that I'm doing? Am I, am I consuming CPU? Am I doing a table access? And if it's a table access, which table I'm reading? If I do that every second, every second, every second for every session, I get a kind of a fuzzy picture of what's going on on my system for a long, for a long period of time. Especially when I, when I have, let's say, a SQL statement that is running for three hours, I have a lot of samples of those three hours. Imagine one sample every second. So I get to understand what is going on with my report from beginning to end. If my SQL is running in a fraction of a second, but I execute that SQL many times, by, by taking snapshots every second, I may get one execution here, and it was on step number five of the execution plan. Take another, another snapshot, it was a different execution, and now it was at step number four. Another one, it was at step number five. By, by doing an aggregate, I get to see where my SQL is spending time. Is, is that clear? It's not perfect. It's not as precise as trace, but it's, I would say, on the trade-off between precise and not having to go back and redo the same stuff, Ash is superior to trace. In my opinion, that's why these days I don't use trace. It's there, I can use it, I know how to use it, but I don't use it, I use ash. So from those one second samples, we only store one of every 10 on history, which is like a long term, what is that is going on? Short term is, is coming from ash in memory, long term from ash in AWR. Sessions, sessions are gonna be either waiting or gonna be on CPU. Then we can aggregate in multiple dimensions. I can aggregate by user, I can aggregate by SQL ID, by, by program, by object, you name it. I can aggregate all, the, all that data in many, many different ways. There is only a small caveat. It requires the diagnostics pack. Most installations, I would say, when they are enterprise and they are production, most installations, they do have diagnostics pack. So that shouldn't be an issue. If I were to compare these two, SQL Trace versus Ash, there are some pros and cons on these two. So in terms of pros for Ash, it's always available, multi-dimension, and I can see the granularity is the execution line. I mean, when I look at execution plan, I can go to the line level, so I can very easily pinpoint where on my long execution plan is that I am consuming time. 
We can use the explain plan four. I don't use it, but we can we can use it. We want to use it. We go explain plan four. Blah blah blah. Just be sure that you don't have binds. If you have binds, just just put the, the actual literal that you will have, so you can get a better idea how your plan is going to look or it may look. Just keep in mind that is not necessarily true, but it's pretty close. And then you select your plan this way. Very easy. Explain plan four. Your statement. And then you look at the, 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 the explain plan that way. You have seen that before, nothing new. This is another way to see this explain plan. We have some predicate information, which is very useful. We have estimated number of rows, so, so we some, together with some costing information. Another method was arrow trace. We can, we can do set arrow trace on. We actually execute the SQL statement. And with that, we get a small subset of the statistics. Not everything, we get a small subset. We executed the SQL, came back with two rows returned. We can see the execution plan. And after the execution plan, we get some metrics. Very easy, very clean, simple. I use arrow trace. Every once in a while, I use arrow trace, especially when you want to compare. I tweak the plan and see how many buffer gets I get. That is, that is how I compare plans with buffer gets. I mean, which one is better? The one that gives me less buffer gets. I can use SQL developer. On SQL developer, I can, I can select which particular child number I want to display. And according to the child number, I can see the corresponding execution plan. It's pretty powerful. I like SQL developer. The plan looks like this. BBMSX plan. Maria was talking about this one. This is, I would say, the preferred Oracle tool, in my opinion to look at the execution plan. It has different APIs. So we can display the plan out of the plan table. The one that I use is this one here, display cursor, but there are some others. Like I can display the plan that is stored on AWR, or I can display a plan that is stored on a baseline. I don't use this one often, but it's available. Syntax is quite simple with some parameters here. If I use a display cursor, it has three parameters. SQL ID, child cursor, format. The format that I use is this combined with this. I say advance all the stats last. That's what I use. Give me as much as possible. In this case, I have this SQL with some binds. I am putting here on the SQL this gather plan statistics. By putting this hint, I get the actual rows. If I don't use the hint, I don't get the actual rows. Unless I do alter session set statistics level, to all, which are equivalent. So I do that, and I get to see this column that I like. Actual rows, I have estimated number of rows, then I can do my, my, my work, right? I can do see where the CBO made a mistake, etc. Nothing new. SQL monitor. Let me show you a real SQL monitor. In the past, you saw the PowerPoint presentation, you saw some, some slides about the SQL monitor. How does it actually look? I'm going to open one of these two. And I'm going to show you here an actual SQL monitor report. I am not connected to any database. I am not using here Enterprise Manager. This is just a, a text file. It's an HTML. It says Enterprise Manager. Yeah, this is the API that I use, but it's a standalone. I am not connected to that database. So it's coming back. It's taking some time to assemble the report, to put it together but all the content of the report is embedded on, it, on the HTML file. I want to just to check that I have connectivity here. That is the symbol that Mauro was using on his presentation. I like that. That is not that he's running anything against the database. Actually, I don't know what is taking some time. Are you have a no, idea? No, why not?
that was flash, right? So, but it is taking some time, right? So. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Hopefully not. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Okay. So what do we have here? Again, this one says in the Enterprise Manager. This is not true. This is not in the Enterprise Manager. This is basically the file that I opened that I created through SQL Plus. I didn't use Enterprise Manager for this. So what do we have? We have the SQL statement. Sometimes when I see that, I say, okay, that's my SQL statement. Show me the entire the entire SQL statement. So I click there. And I have my SQL statement. I can save this one someplace. I can say put it maybe on the, I don't know, maybe on the downloads. Save it. I get my SQL statement so I can actually read it to make sense of it. Oh, my SQL statement has a lot of hints. When I see a lot of hints, I usually think this developer has no clue what he's doing. Unfortunately, in that, in that case, the developer was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, oops. So, what else do I see? Of course, I, I get to see that it hangs. Why everything worked perfectly fine before this session? Let me see the other one. Go to open, the other one is, is not open in any ways. Let me just close these two because they're just in resources. And this one switch should be the okay, should work, right? <sighs> just bear with me for a moment here. <laughs> Believe it or not, this doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you are here in front of a group of people. So I get to see down here the execution plan. Because usually you can scroll. Only I have no clue why this one is slow. But let me just go over explain this one here. This, this report, which was produced through SQL Plus, can show me performance of the SQL. I can see performance, for example, this one took uh, two minutes, right? Most of the time was CPU. I can see that, that one as green over here. It shows me the execution plan. I can scroll up and down, and it can show me, it can show me estimated number of rows, actual number of rows, and where the time was consumed. I can see the plan uh, as a tree. I can see some metrics. It's pretty nice. Honestly, the report is cool. When it works. Now, honestly, oh, it works. I don't know why it's not working here, but it, it works. Now, if I were to show you how to produce a report, this is how I produce a report. I run this script, so it's called SQL, SQL Mon. And actually, what it does is ask if you have the tuning pack, because SQL Monitor report requires the tuning pack, and it asks as a second parameter what is the SQL ID. Just those two. And after that, it's doing some finding your SQL. But at the end, what really does is it calls this API, DBMS SQL Tune Report, SQL Monitor, and it basically passes some parameters that were assembled according to your answers. And after that, it's doing again something similar. So we, we have SQL Monitor Report. What happens is this one, it produces a list of executions. Imagine this SQL was executed five times. So it gives you a report with the five executions, with the time for those five executions, and then it gives you, for every one of these five executions, it gives you a SQL monitor report on HTML and on text. Now that I mentioned text, let's look at this version on text. So that is not going to hang. So that would be this one here. I can see that is my SQL statement, some metrics here. Then I can look at my execution plan down here, 
and I have actual rows, and I have estimated number of rows. This is the text version, so if for some reason the HTML is not working, I can actually look at my SQL here. Is that clear? The other one that I mentioned is a list. In this case, I only have one execution that shows like this, but if I have multiple executions for this SQL, it shows down here. So in other words, if I run this little script, SQL Mon, and I run it from SQL Plus on a client, I have no access to my SQL, to my database server, I have no access to the Impress Manager, it doesn't matter, I can still get my report. So that means for developers, this is what we want to use. If we don't get access to the Impress Manager, there is always a workaround, run this little script from SQL Plus, and you get to see your SQL Monitor report. Any, any questions so far? No questions, we are all tired, right? Or is, too hot? is, it, is it too hot here in the room? Can you put the temperature to, to maybe 50 degrees? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maru. These scripts are on your site? These scripts are on my site, yes. Um, and these are free. These are like in SQL Developer Toad, so you can... SQL Developer Toad. Well, now that I work for Oracle, I cannot say anything about SQL Developer <laughs> No, I'm not very familiar with SQL developer. Well, with SQL developer, SQL developer, yes, but not Toad. Yeah, with SQL developer, you get to see execution plan, but it's, it doesn't give you the SQL monitor report. You cannot, as far as I know, you cannot run it from, from SQL developer. Am I incorrect? Can you run it SQL? I think so. Okay, so then the answer is I don't know. I don't know. What I do, I run it from SQL Plus, I get my file, I open my file, and I have my report. Okay? Okay, so I was mentioning, I was talk, talking about, uh, there was another question, some place? No? Okay. So, SQL Monitor Report is part of the tuning pack. It can show you the execution plan as a table, as we saw, or it can show you as a tree, either, either way. We can see timeline per plan, so we can see for every operation on the execution plan, we can see where it started, where it completed. And it can also show you some, some history. So it can show you this operation was active here, and then I have this one here, and I have this one here. So it gives you a better idea of what is that is going on. It shows you the values of the BAM variables that were available to the optimizer at the time the SQL was parsed. Shows you predicates. It's nice and easy to understand. And it's executed either from Enterprise Manager. You have access to the Enterprise Manager. That's fine. If not, you can execute SQL Monitor from SQL Plus. Looks like this, blah, blah. Specialized tools. Specialized tools, we have SQL T explain. Anyone here using C has used SQL T explain before? One hand, two hands, okay. We have SQL health check, and we have SQL D360. We have three tools of which I, I would consider specialized tools. They give you more information, more details. These days, from these three, Personally, I only use this one here. Unless there is a site that already executed this one. Yeah, so, but it's really up to you. I mean, if you are familiar with this one and you want to use SQL T by all means or SQL Health Check, but the one I, was, I, would, I would endorse today is this one here, not the other two. Okay. Even if I develop those, I, I was too young. Or maybe today I'm too old, that's why Mauro is doing the tools. <laughs> Are there, others, are there other tools which I consider specialized tools? I would say there are, for example, Toad could do something good. Really, I don't know. They could use some other tools. Usually those tools are commercial, so that means you have to pay, and I am cheap. I don't pay for coffee, so I, I don't pay for tools. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to root cause analysis, so the, the, that part was about diagnostics. Now when it comes to root cause analysis, unfortunately, there is no shortcut. Root cause analysis requires time, a lot of time. So this is where you want to spend your time. And, and as DBAs or developers, we usually don't have that time. So that means at some point you have to say, okay, you know what? Instead of watching TV, I'm going to dedicate a couple of hours to this, and I will try to understand what is that is going on. And that is painful, but that is the, the only way I can see we can actually get better at SQL tuning is when you start investing time. There are no shortcuts. At least, I haven't seen any shortcut. So you go over 
the output of these specialized tools. And as you go over, you say, oh, now, now I can see. For example, let's say I'm working with vines that are changing over time. And then you say, okay, I can see there is a portion here that has to do with adaptive course of shading. I kind of understand what it is, but not too well. So let me do some research. Let me get the understanding of adaptive course of shading. Now let me go back to the tool, see what kind of information it provides, and then I, can, I may be able to make sense of what's going on. And that is the way to learn. Just keep in mind that these tools, they include what is needed for SQL tuning. We are the consumers of the tools, and we just made them available for everyone. And what we do is SQL tuning. So that means we develop the tools having SQL tuning in mind. What we present there is what we consume. So when we're doing that kind of review, we're looking or we're trying to find correlations and possibilities. We say, well, I notice this bind is using this value that goes ascending, and sometimes it goes like a value that is out of order. I was not expecting this value. What could be the implication? Oh, and I notice that it happens exactly when I gather statistics. What may be happening there? When you start doing this kind of analysis and correlation, you start finding possibilities. You say, I think if I have this scenario, this could, be, this could be a side effect of what I see, right? So let me try to prove or disprove. You're trying to understand the optimizer. You have to question everything. And don't, don't believe everything that you see right there because you're trying to find a quick answer. No, you say, this one looks like a dog. Is this a dog or is it a cat? So it's like, I mean, it's, you have to question everything. After some point, you have to ask for help. There is always someone in your network that knows more about SQL tuning than you. That is true for everyone. No, not for everyone? <laughs> in my case, I go to Mauro. I go to Mauro. When I struggle with SQL tuning, I say, Mauro, I need your help. But if there is nothing wrong when you go back to someone and you're asking for help, OK? And if you have no one to ask for help and you can solve all the issues, good for you. But if you struggle, just try to find who would be an, a, a nice peer that can say, you know what, let's exchange some ideas. Let me, let me consult something. There is nothing wrong with consulting with someone else. Okay? I do that all the time. So enjoy the ride. SQL tuning is not easy, not easy. When you really want to find the root cause, uh, you have to put your pride to the side and say, you know what? If I don't find the root cause, let me see if someone else can help me find the root cause. There is always a root cause. Typical steps, well, find where the time is being spent. And let's say you are doing your troubleshooting, is that my, my execution plan is this long. I try to focus where the plan breaks and where the time is being spent. And then you start looking at things like estimated number of rows, actual number of rows, there's a big mismatch here. Maybe I need extended stats, maybe I need to collect statistics, maybe I need an index, maybe I need something, right? So you start finding stuff. What is the history of this SQL? Has it ever worked before? Can I actually kill the SQL entirely? Is someone consuming the output? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes you see SQL that nobody cares, nobody uses, nobody, nobody knows what, what the SQL is. So can you make sense of the SQL and the execution plan? If the answer is no, then you have to invest a lot of time there because you need to understand the SQL and the execution plan in order to make progress. Once you work that piece that takes a long time, it comes from mediation. How do we fix it? Sometimes it's trivial. I mean, once you know what is broken, I mean, why it broke, the, the, the remediation is, is like, yeah, if we, someone dropped an index. Oh, okay, okay, remediation is easy. I put back the index. Or the statistics are missing. Okay, I need to gather the stats. Or my index became invalid, or it become, became invisible. Things like that are easy. Sometimes you have more than one option. But you're trying, when you have more than one option to fix something, you are trying to say, OK, wh what assumption I'm making here that is wrong? So you're trying to prove yourself wrong instead of trying to prove yourself right. So I don't, at some point, you say, you know what? This is, looks like this is the answer, but I will try to prove myself that that is not the answer. Then you implement the, the smallest scope fix. So don't go crazy and start changing parameters or, or gathering stats for the entire schema when you're trying to isolate your fix to the, to the smallest space possible. So that means if you can fix your one SQL, that is better than just trying to shoot for a 
change these parameters because I don't know why it's, why it's there. Just hoping that the sequence is going to be fixed. You don't want a big scope, you want a small scope. Don't guess. I call that the piñata method, and we saw some piñatas today. The piñata method is when you, when you, you blindfold yourself, and you get a stick, and you're just, just hitting the thing as, until it breaks, right? Sometimes we do tuning that way. We don't know what we're doing. We're just trying different stuff, guessing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So just be careful with that. And trust no one, no one. See, someone says, oh, put, put this, this parameter there, because I, I was on a client three years ago, and I put the parameter, and everything went fine. No, no. I mean, you will see some consultants out there saying, oh, we have some silver bullet methods. That has two letters on my vocabulary, OK? One start with B. <laughs> So, so three important topics, and we, we are short on time, but this is something that you, we, have, we have gone through this before. This is just a recap. Execution plan is very important. This is usually where you start. I mean, you have a SQL performing poorly. First thing is, show me the execution plan. You need to understand better the cost-based optimizer. It's very easy to say, but very hard to accomplish. Cost-based optimizer is a big animal. There is a good book by Jonathan Lewis, which is about the cost-based optimizer, that basically shows you how you compute the cost. Maria was saying this morning, no, you don't need to know that. Well, in that sense, I disagree. When you, when you are diving deep into issues on performance, you need to know. You need to know how cost is computed. Because sometimes, when you look at some cost that is kind of weird, you want to understand how that cost was computed because you want to see maybe it was a statistic, maybe it was an index, maybe it was correlation. In order to do that better, you, you really want to understand how cost is computed. It's more advanced, but at some point you have to do it. Plan stability, that's another one that you need to understand. Keep in mind there are different ways to achieve plan stability, like hints, storal lines, SQL profiles, SQL patches, SQL plan baseline. And then on top of those, we have some tricks. You, you can actually copy an execution plan from one system and put it into another system using profiles or using baselines. There are methods to do that. You can take the execution plan from this SQL and put it on this other SQL. We can do that. There is a lot that we can do, a lot. Um, that's why, I mean, this, this topic, when your concern is plans that are flipping, that's, that's an area you want to invest more time. How can I make my system more stable? And the question is, why my plans are flipping, which are two different things. Regarding the execution plan, if you do not understand the SQL statement or the execution plan, put the brakes and then invest some time understanding the SQL and the execution plan. Otherwise, it's like, it, it, it's very hard to fix something unless you know, it's like if I'm trying to fix my car and I don't know anything about mechanics, guess what is going to happen? I'm going to break something, right? So, which actually has happened before, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to tie, my, my car was leaking, the radiator, right? A small, tiny, tiny leak. That is easy. I, I see something that is around the, 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 the hose, and I can see I can, I can basically use a screwdriver to make it tighter, right? Easy. I got my screwdriver, tighter. Fine, the leak was gone. But I was not pleased. I said, you know what, let me do a little more. Crack. <laughs> so I broke the, the neck of the radiator. I had to change the whole thing, right? So just, just be careful with that. If you don't know what you're doing, just stop there. I know, Mauro, I know, five minutes. OK. For the code based optimizer, just keep in mind the CBO was released many, many years ago. So it's quite complex. Just get this book from, from uh, Jonathan Lewis if you want to understand better the optimizer. And just get to know it. I mean, it takes some time. It takes some time to know the optimizer, but it's, it's worth. Plan stability, I mentioned several ways to use plan stability. Keep in mind, plan stability, except SQL plan management, everything else is a band-aid. It's just something like it's, it's, a, it's a temporarily. SQL plan management can be considered a fix when you know what you're doing. But if you are finding yourself that you have to use SQL plan management often, there is a major issue that requires your attention sooner or later. Regarding popular free diagnostic tools, we mentioned already these three, SQL T-Explain, SQL Head Check, SQL D360. 
standalone scripts, like, like the one I mentioned about SQL uh, Monitor. There are some on the Kerry Osborne website. Some, you have some free scripts someplace on your, on your blog? No, not yet? OK, Kerry Osborne has some free scripts. Sometimes, I mean, using these free scripts, they, they save you some time. Otherwise, you have to write your own. SQL Display looks like this. SQL D360 looks like this with a bunch of uh, uh, charts. All, all that you see here is coming from SQL D360. These two tools are really good. There are some pros and cons for every one of these two. If you read that list, you will understand why my preferred method is SQL D360. If you don't see it right away, I'm going to show you here. Required installation. Mm -hmm. That is a showstopper for me today. Uh, uh, SQL Tuning Roadmap, you start with a clean environment, find your SQL, get some diagnostics, spend time analyzing the output, determine the root cause, implement. That is pretty much what is SQL Tuning in my, in my mind. Questions? No questions. Well, then thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.